partners in relationship. And I can only have a relationship with you when I stop for you. When I talk to you. Now, when I approached the people, I said, hello, sir, how are you? God treats everybody with respect. He doesn't look down on anyone. In fact, he looks highly on those that are lowly favored in this world. And with a bag of food, we would say, sir, would you like some food? We're giving free food out today. And a blanket. And sometimes it's, one guy said, no, I'm good. Okay, so I talked to him. Where are you from? You sound like you're funny like me from Philadelphia. Nice for Manhattan. Almost as bad, right? <laughs> so um, kept talking, and then after we talked, I said, do you mind if we pray? He said, sure. I said, what can I pray for? You know, I, I think it's, you know, like, oh, for my alcoholism to go away, my cirrhosis of the liver to be healed. No, he said, ah, for my faith to be restored. Amen. Wow. <laughs> Man. All right, so we prayed for him, Monique and I, and then he said, uh, and then he prayed for us. Prayed blessings over us. Powerful God. Our God is so wonderful. He writes a new story. He, he's writing a story in heaven. There's a spiritual kingdom that's being constructed all around us that we don't see. Because our minds many times are earthly focused. But as you can see what Jesus said in his most powerful sermon. Blessed are the poor in spirit, for theirs is the kingdom of heaven. The people, the homeless people, not only are they poor, they don't have money, but they are poor in spirit. There are people in churches, too, that are poor in spirit. They call themselves Christians, but they don't know God. They don't know the Holy Spirit. They don't know Jesus. Or they've been so disrupted by life that they're aching and hurting inside. And they become so poor in spirit. They don't have the joy of the Lord anymore. They don't feel his love inside. Whether it's a financial poverty or whether it's a spiritual poverty, it still needs attention. It needs the love attention of God. Now we've been, I have a testimony uh, on YouTube about this, but Isaiah 61, I've been showing it every Sunday. Peter, you are a rock. But that doesn't mean you can see through these things. <laughs> and it, it was kind of a miracle. Because, well, it was a miracle. I had, I had a DVD on the, uh, on the player from Vietnam, and it was a translated sermon from Pastor Levy. And all of a sudden, while I was praying, the DVD player went on, and right on there, a sermon on Isaiah 61 came on. So, and we've had other confirmations. So I've been, I've been preaching off this every Sunday since. The Spirit of the Lord God is upon me because the Lord has anointed me to bring good news to the poor. P-O-O-R. Another four-letter word, R-I-C-H. Now, I'm not condemning anybody who's rich. God's taking care of us. I'm not rich, but I'm okay. <laughs> um, thank you, God. <laughs> but what we're talking, he says, if say you are rich, go to the poor. If you're poor, go to the poor. If you're in between, go to the poor. There's a common theme, out, theme here. We are to go to the poor, to the poor, to the poor. The power of God, the anointing of God is much stronger in impoverished communities. That's because that's where he is. He is already with the poor waiting for us to show up to release the power, to release the love, to release healing, to break the chains. The rich will not receive from me. How many people have I seen come into this little church? I pray for them. The Holy Ghost will knock them down. They'll get a word of knowledge. They might get healed. And they don't come back. They are not poor in spirit. When you're poor in spirit, you say, oh, God. Oh, God, thank you. Thank you. You touched me. You healed me. You saved me. You filled me with the Holy Ghost. You gave me your kingdom. You gave me your love. You gave me your presence. But if you're so full up with yourself and the world, you're rich, you don't need him. You don't need what I have to offer. He has sent me to bind up the brokenhearted. They are also poor in spirit. To proclaim the liberty to the captives and the opening of the prison to those who are bound. To proclaim the year of the Lord's favor and the day of vengeance of our God. To comfort all who mourn. 
to grant to those who mourn in Zion, to give them a beautiful headdress instead of ashes, the oil of gladness instead of mourning, the garment of praise instead of a faint spirit, that they may be called oaks of righteousness, the planting of the Lord, that he may be glorified. So we go. We go to people that are obviously poor, poor in spirit, as we did with the homeless. And something happens in our spirit. If our spirit's getting a little bit impoverished the minute we encounter the, the place where God wants us to be. When the poor are touched by our presence, why pe when people are touched with our love, the love that God has given us, we are strengthened and empowered. Psalm 41, 1 to 3. Blessed is the one who considers the... Thank you. The poor. In the day of trouble, the Lord delivers him. The Lord protects him and keeps him alive. He is called blessed in the land. You do not give him up to the will of his enemies. The Lord sustains him on his sickbed. In his illness, you restore him to full health. People want the Holy Spirit. People want God to do something in their life. So we say, God, help me. God, do this. God, do that. If you really, really, really want to see the activation of the power of God in your life, go to the poor. He said, if you go to the poor, I'll heal your disease. If you go to the poor, I'll save you from trouble. I will deliver you from evil spirits. I will resurrect your life if you go to the poor. The one man that didn't want to take the food that I had for him. I said, well, is there anybody else I could give the food to? He said, yeah, there are some guys sleeping on the grates down by Constitution Avenue. I think that's amazing. He has nothing. But he sees people that are even poorer than he was. And he said, go ahead, give them the food. God will bless that homeless man. Give to the poor. Give to the poor. Give to the poor. We've been afraid to say this because of communism. We've been afraid to say this because of political ideology. But the kingdom of God is not a political ideology. It is a compassionate love for people who cannot help themselves. It is not a Republican party. It is not a Democratic party. It is the kingdom of heaven. It is the heart of God. It is the love of God. And the only way that love, that compassion, the fulfillment of people's lives is going to come is through you and me. Amen. But we're so bound and so fearful. We're so selfish. We've become so American. Excuse me. I mean that for everybody. I'm not saying white Americans like me. I mean every American. <laughs> That's it. That we have such that comfort. The comfort is just killing us. It's destroying us. Christians cannot function in a life of over-prosperity, over-self-focus, over-selfishness. You know, I, and, and now we're presented... Uh, I don't want to talk about politics. But say you have one candidate who's against homosexual marriage and abortion and the other one who sticks up for the poor and you have to pick. What is this? That's not a Christian agenda on either side. It's all of it. Yes, the poor. Yes, the uh, compassion to the homosexuals, but not supporting a lifestyle of that. And yet, no to abortion. That's the Christian agenda. But to love everybody. To love the poor, to love the homosexuals, to love the drug addicts, to love the alcoholics, to love the rich, to love everybody. Into the kingdom. Into the kingdom. That's a Christian agenda. 1 Corinthians 14.1 Pursue love and earnestly desire the spiritual gifts, especially that you may prophesy. There's been a transformation in my thinking and my soul, what I am hungry for. There was a time uh, just a couple years ago, and even up till recently, that my passion was constantly for the power of God, for the fire of God. And there are times that the Lord has anointed me where all I have to do is blow on people and they fall down. There are times when I don't even have to touch people and they will fall down. But there's been something that's been occurring in my soul over the past year in particular that says what about the first part of that verse? Pursue love. Because you can be gifted, you can be anointed, you can be empowered, but if you are not loving, you have missed a vital ingredient. God is? Love. Hallelujah. The power comes from love. You get the love first or you cause a train wreck to happen. If I'm filled with the Holy Ghost and I can heal the sick and I can raise the dead and I don't love anybody, oh, 
I have missed it. I have missed it because God is love. God is love. So when I go to the poor, even if I pray for them and they're not healed, but I love them, I have fulfilled the first call on the agenda of God. They go together. This is one sentence. Love and the spiritual gifts. We Many people desire the spiritual gifts so they can be Benny Hinn on the stage with everybody looking at them and more people coming to enjoy them. And then the spiritual gifts become an entertainment. It is not an entertainment. God is not here for our entertainment. God is here to break the chains, to set the captives free, to love, love, love. And the demonstration of his power and the signs, the wonders, and the miracles are to show that there is a living God who loves you. A living God. When he walked into the church and I started talking to him about Jesus, first time he's ever been in church, he had a speck of gold on his head. <laughs> He did it to show that he's alive and real. You don't know Jesus yet, but when you walked in, he touched you. You've never heard what you heard until you walked up here today. And he told you about himself in your spirit because he loves you, not because you had memorized every Bible verse. It's his love. And yes, there's power. That's I saw gold dust on the floor before you walked up. There's power in the manifestation of miracles. But he does it because he loves us. We should never, ever minister to people to demonstrate that we have the anointing without love. It's a train wreck. It's a pr pride, a ride of pride. It's an ego trip that is going to take you to hell because Satan was prime. Satan was at the right hand of God. Satan had everything, everything. But he was proud. And God said, get out of my house, not in my house. Because we can, anoint, uh, we can be anointed and move in the spiritual gifts, but that pride, the arrogance that can come from being filled with the Holy Spirit, that we look down on people who are not. I've done this. I'm preaching to myself right now. Believe me. But I've learned that that is not the right way. I, but it still bothers me when people don't uh, acknowledge the Holy Spirit. Don't get me wrong. I'm very militant about that. But I have to love them. I have to love them. Oh, I'm sorry. You don't have that. Now, there is a man named Simon. There is a great persecution in the Jerusalem church. And Saul was the one, one of them, leading uh, this persecution. So, Philip who was a deacon, he was not an apostle. He was a deacon, he was an administrator of the church, was filled with the Holy Spirit, as many of us are, and he went into Samaria, and he went in to bring uh, the good news. He came in to bring the gospel, to Jesus Christ died for our sins and he rose again. And when he did so, the signs and the power of God were flowing, and people were getting healed. They were getting saved from, the, uh, from demons. They were getting set free. and. Uh, there was a man named Simon there who had kept all of this area captivated by the magic that he was performing. He was performing magic arts, not uh, Holy Spirit arts, okay? And people thought that he was a man of God because he was using trickery. He was using uh, uh, things that were actually of the devil to do things. But when they saw the real power of God and they said, this is it, so people started to follow Philip. Because Jesus' anointing was on him. So now there is a separation. And Simon said, he saw what was going on. Simon saw the power of God. And he said, that's real and I want to have it. So Simon ran after Jesus. At least his disciples. And said, I believe. I believe. It's obvious. The signs and wonders are real. But there was a man. Okay, Simon uh, uh, then... Uh, I think I just told that story, so I won't go back over that. Um, yeah, go to the next one. Honey. Then they laid their hands. Okay, so now you have uh, the apostles coming, and they're laying hands on people, and people are receiving the Holy Ghost, and they're falling down, and they're seeing all of these manifestations. And then Simon realized that to be filled with the Holy Spirit occurred when they laid hands on people. So he said, I will pay you money. Can I have that power? 
Now, this is a man, Simon, has already professed belief in Jesus Christ. See, many people are attracted to the spiritual power of God because they want their pride to be filled. They want their ministry to be elevated up. And they want to look great. And they forgot that it is the love of God. It is the humble servant who is the representative of Jesus Christ. That we are bringing that power so that people can know Jesus, that he's the living God. Not so that they know Bill Murphy. So that I don't become filled with pride. That I don't become filled like Satan with pride. And then start to drive a church into the ground because I am not humble enough to recognize that I am a merely a servant who's been anointed to bring good news to the poor, to set the captives free, to heal the sick, to do the dirty work, to go to the homeless and love them, to pray for people that nobody else wants to even talk to. That's my job. That's my job. That's your job. Mm -hmm. The lower you go in the kingdom of heaven, the higher you go. Amen. Pastors who are not humble are, are in big trouble. And there's a temptation as a pastor to be proud. That's how Satan gets so many of them. And it ruins them. It ruins them and the people they're associated with. They start to get money, they become greedy. They start to become famous, they forget about the little people. The more anointing and the more glory they get for themselves, the less other people receive. And it's all about them. Their name is on banners, their name is on TV. They have airplanes, they have this and that. And they don't go to the poor anymore. They don't go to the homeless. So it, 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 actually there is a trick in the power of God. And Satan will deceive you. And if your heart is not right like Simon's, and you just want it for your glory, you have been poisoned, you have been tricked, you have been deceived. It almost becomes witchcraft. In some cases it does. That's why we always have to operate as Christians, as Holy Spirit-filled Christians in love. In humility, as servants. Now, when Peter saw that Simon was asking to buy the gifts of the Holy Spirit for his own pride, he says to him, For I see that you are in the gall of bitterness and in the bond of iniquity. And Simon answered, Pray for me to the Lord that nothing of what you have said may come upon me. He saw that. He, Simon was saved, but he was not delivered. He still had demons, and those demons were thirsting for power. They were thirsting for the power of God. This is why deliverance is so important. Now, do you want to be Holy Spirit filled and able to do miracles and be filled with demons? You've got a horrible combination there, but that can actually happen. We don't want that. <laughs> So we get into a humble mode before God, especially when the Holy Spirit is coming upon our life. And we confess our sins. And we seek out the Holy Spirit for our inner healing, not just as a manifestation, not just as an entertainment, but so that we ourselves inside can see what is broken because we have broken hearts. We have demonic bondage. We have strongholds. And that's why the Holy Spirit is upon us individually. Let's take first take stock of ourselves and get healed through the power of God. And then, and then, knowing that we have been weak, when we go to someone else who's got an addiction, someone else who's struggling with lust, someone else who's struggling with whatever it is, we can say, I've been there, and now I've been set free, and this is the same power that set me free. I'm going to release in love to you. The Jesus love. I'm going to release it into your life. 1 Corinthians 10.33 Just as I try to please everyone in everything I do, not seeking my own advantage, but that of many, that they may be saved. Paul, the most anointed person, didn't... Oh, I feel the Holy Spirit right now. Uh, the most anointed person did nothing to seek his own advantage. He wasn't building the church of Paul. He was building the church of Jesus Christ. So when God gives you a little church like he's given me, that's my assignment. Mm -hmm. And there are no walls on any of our churches. There are people out in the streets that need to know Jesus Christ. Mm -hmm. 
That's why you've been anointed. The next time you take a breath saying, Father, Holy Spirit, Jesus, fill me with fire. It's for the purpose of equipping you, building you up, setting you free, and letting you loose letting you loose into this world and against the kingdom of Satan so that you can set the captives free. You are a soldier of God. You're yes, being equipped yes. with the Holy Spirit anointing to help other people. Praise God, yes. Whether it's in a little church or on a street, in a park bench, or in your family, or in your school, or in your home, that's why you want the Holy Spirit. It's great to go to a conference. Conferences are awesome because you'll be touched by, the God, by God in a way you haven't before. But that is not your perpetual situation with God. If every year you're just looking to go to the conference, you have missed it. The anointing is for use. It is for good works. In Romans it says, you have been saved for good works. And you are empowered to help other people with the gospel, with love, with the power of God. It's not for conferences only. Receive and go. Receive and go. Amen. Amen. First Corinthians 10, 24. Let no one seek his own good, but the good of his neighbor. Amen. This is the Christian. Yes, thank you. It is not about me. It is about me loving you. Yes. So when I offered to pray for uh, one man yesterday that I knew who was demonized, uh, he said no. I said, well, God bless you, sir. I didn't say, come on, man, you got demons. I've got to cast them out. No. <laughs> I've done that in the past. So <laughs> if somebody doesn't want to get free from a demon, by the way, they will not. So you will waste your time. I've done this many, many times. Staying up all night, casting out demons because the person hadn't repented yet enough. They haven't taken it seriously. They haven't changed their lifestyle. They haven't committed to Jesus. You can't get them out. They'll keep coming back in. Luke 9, 54 to 56. And when his disciples, James and John, observed this, they said, Lord, do you... Okay, so Jesus has set his face to Jerusalem. He's going to die on the cross. And he comes to a Samaritan town. And they will not let him in. Because they don't like people. They don't like Jews. They don't like Jews going to Jerusalem especially. So they say, you can't come in here. So... Our, our brothers, James and John, said, Oh, this makes me mad. They're disrespecting my Jesus. Good, good, good. But they said this, Do you wish us to command fire to come down from heaven and consume them, even as Elijah did? Now, this is what happens sometimes when we get filled with the Holy Spirit. We get angry at people who do not believe. And we try to exercise that power on top of them in a vengeful, wrathful way. I have done this, so I repent. <laughs> that is not God's way. His way is to love them. And he says this, but he turned and rebuked and severely censured them. He said, you do not know of what sort of spirit you are. For the Son of Man did not come to destroy men's lives, but to save them from the penalty of eternal death. And they journeyed on to another village. We have one mission. It is to bring people into the kingdom. It is to bring them into salvation. And whatever tool God has given us to use, we shall use it. Hallelujah. To the measure he has given you. To the faith that you have. If it's a spiritual gift of prophecy. If it's the gift of healing. If it's all of the above, but maybe lower measure. If it's because you got extra money that can go to the poor. If it's because you have extra time. If it's because you're a good listener. Whatever it is, those are tools. They are only tools. It is not you. You did not anoint yourself to cast out demons. It is not you. It is not in the name of Bill I cast this demon out. You'll be in big trouble if you do that. Don't use my name. It is in the name of Jesus. To be healed in the name of Jesus. To be saved in the name of Jesus. Amen. We are his instruments, his tools. We are not great. He is great. He is in us. Yet we are to earnestly desire those spiritual gifts. In humility. So God, pour out your fire on Lord, increase the gift of prophecy. Increase the gift of healing. Give me the gift of discernment, Lord. Not for my glory, but for yours. We have to learn this or we will self-destruct. We must learn to be humble, but powerful and bold. 
Romans 11, 29. For God's gifts and his call are irrevocable. He never draws them, excuse me, he never withdraws them when once they are given and he does not change his mind about those to whom he gives his grace or to whom he sends his call. You can be a screwed up dude and be filled with the Holy Ghost. We don't want that. We want to get healed. We want to be holy. We don't want to be walking around as monsters with God also working inside us. This is why we want to repent. We want to get holy so that his power comes out in, pure, in a pure vessel. He may not take him. He didn't take it away from Todd Bentley. He's still, he's still healing people after adultery and alcoholism. 1 Corinthians 8, 2, 2 to 3. If anyone imagines that he knows something, he does not yet know, as he ought to know. But if anyone loves God, he is known by God. Amen. Don't worry about how smart you are. Yeah. Don't worry about how many PhDs you have. Don't worry about that. But do you know God? Do you know his love? Are you a lover? Are you a lover like he is? That's what is important. And I'm hurrying to get us out. Matthew 18, 1 to 4. At that time, the disciples came to Jesus saying, Who is the greatest in the kingdom of heaven? And calling to him a child, he put him in the midst of them and said, Truly I say to you, unless you turn and become like children, you will never enter the kingdom of heaven. Whoever humbles himself like this child is the greatest in the kingdom of heaven. See why church groups split? There's no humility. We have to be humble in a church. If there's an abuse, you try to deal with it. But everybody wants to be the big shot. Everybody wants to be in charge. You're going to have division. Crash. Burn. Come like children. And this is why God spoke to me. Children. Children are humble. Ch children listen. Children want to learn. Children are simple. Children love. Children play. Children have fun. Children admire their daddy. This is the way our church is supposed to be. If heaven is like that, so much more. Must we strive for that in our churches? In our own actions, in our own attitudes, we are to be like children because you can't get to heaven if you're not. Don't be a big shot. Don't be the adult. Be sensible, be wise, be prudent, but be a child in your heart with your God. If you're casting out a demon, you are a ruthless warrior. And I will scream even when people say you shouldn't scream at them, I do. Because sometimes they come out when I scream at them. But I am a warrior when I am doing battle against the kingdom of hell. But when I am in the kingdom of heaven, I am a humble child. When I am dealing with my brothers and sisters in Christ, I am humble. I am loving. I am lowly. That's my goal. Romans 13, 8. Keep out of debt and owe no man anything except to love one another. For he who loves his neighbor, who practices loving others, has fulfilled the law. Relating to one's fellow men meeting all its requirements. We don't have to worry about memorizing the, the uh, Ten Commandments. It's a great thing to know. What you need to know is the love of God. What you need to do is love people. When you love people, you don't sin against God. You don't sin against other people. It is love, love, love. Everything comes back to love. Giving food to the homeless. A love act. Love. His kingdom is founded on love. His sermons must always be founded on love. The attitude in our hearts and minds must always be in love. And when we pray for people, we pray out of love, not out of arrogance and pride. When we worship, it is not a time for the worshiper to be showing off. It isn't about me preaching. It's not for me to get glory for myself. And when you're playing the guitar, the keyboard, it's about God. You're a servant. You're only a servant. I am only a servant. And I have to say that and mean it. I'm not, don't, don't joke around with it. I'm just a servant. It's all God. Inside, you're the star. It's not about that. And I, and I never, in, in our church, we, I, we, you know, I want people all to be involved in the worship. It's not about a performance. It's never a performance. Yeah. Is the church of God like this today? No. Get packed churches, a performance, a light show. You get a slick message that has nothing to do with repentance. Might not have anything to do with the Holy Spirit. Easy to digest. Easy to hear. It's easy to live a life as an American Christian. Even if you're on your way to hell. It's not easy. 
to humble yourself when people are persecuting you. It's not easy to go and love somebody that has no interest in you. It's not easy. That's a Christian Christ in you. That's it. Yeah, if the worship team would like to come up. Let, let's, uh, if you guys have songs you want to put on there, we can change that. And then uh, while they're uh, worshiping, if you, if you want to come up for prayer, please come up for prayer. Father God, Holy Spirit. Lord, I pray, do not lose your focus on God right now. Whatever you're doing, whether you're on the worship team or you're sitting here, I know you guys are tired because you drove a long way and this is your second sermon. And I know you young guys are not even used to being in church. But Holy Spirit, I pray, help us stay focused, Amen. God. Because eternally we will be with you, Father. Yes. Help us in our weakness, God, that we can still, we're still here in your presence. We know that you're still here. And there's more, there's more, there's more. There's more.